and uh, we'll just jump right in here. Thank you, everybody, for coming to Something to Talk About from the Bainbridge Island Senior Community Center. Uh, we're grateful for Fieldstone Communities of Bainbridge Island for sponsoring the, these programs on a variety of topics. Today, we're going to be talking uh, about fraud and how to spot it and how to avoid it and what to do uh, when you, if you, we hope you don't, become a victim of it. Fieldstone, uh, if you're interested in learning more about their memory care and independent living uh, and assisted living uh, up on Rolling Bay, you can give them a call at 360-594-1010. Also, we like to begin these programs by acknowledging that we are meeting on the ancestral homeland of the Suquamish people, the people of the clear salt water who have been uh, taking care of and uh, responsible citizens of the Salish Sea and its environs since time immemorial. We're grateful for their hospitality. With us today, Colin McDonald, and you're um, you're an attorney, Colin, I guess. And, That's correct. And uh, you're working with the FTC? That's correct. I am a full-time employee of the Federal Trade Commission. Great. We really appreciate you coming here today and uh, sharing some information about the latest on um, a never-ending sort of whack-a-mole of fraudsters out there trying to figure out how to trick us. Uh, that is a, a very apt description. Um, there are currently three phones on my desk, and all three of them have gotten scam phone calls today. Uh, so the, <laughs> the bad news for you is that no matter what it is you do, uh, Everybody is subject to getting these kinds of annoying calls and scams. Uh, there's there's no way to completely avoid them, but hopefully we can cover some uh, tricks to help spot them and help prevent them from doing any real harm. Um, Great. So, we really appreciate that. So if you want to get started with your little presentation, uh, that would be a good way to get going. Perfect. All right. Um, well, so as Reed mentioned, my name is Colin McDonald. I am an enforcement attorney for the Northwest region of the Federal Trade Commission. Um, before I get started uh, in a very lawyer-like uh, disclaimer, let me point out that the opinions I'm going to share with you today are my own. They don't necessarily reflect uh, the views of the commission as a whole or of any individual commissioner. Um, that said, I, uh, a lot of this information does come straight from uh, the organization as a whole. Uh, and so hopefully this is very useful. All right, so first off, who are we? Uh, the FTC is the Federal General Consumer Protection Agency. Um, we work through a number of ways to try to protect consumers from being scammed and to make consumers whole when they have been scammed. We're also a law enforcement agency, which means our job is to put a stop to fraud when we find it. Um, it is to uh, make sure that it cannot continue, it cannot repeat, and when possible, to redress consumers who have been harmed. Um, so my day job is as an attorney. Um, I sue companies who we suspect are engaged in unfair or deceptive trade practices, um, as well as work on consumer education to help consumers identify how they are potentially at risk and prevent uh, any harm that they may suffer. We put out educational materials uh, in both English and Spanish. Um, so if you find that this information is useful, you want to pass it along to other people, all of this information is available on our website, ftc.gov. Uh, if you have an organization that distributes information, um, we do have bulk order information, so you can both distribute it electronically or in paper form, um, and we will send you those. A wonderful read. I see you have some of our bookmarks. Um, we make those available free of charge at bulkorder.ftc.gov. So to just give you a picture of what is going on in, in the fraud landscape right now, um, the FTC receives consumer complaints either directly or through state attorneys general, better business bureaus, or other organizations that funnel their information to us. Um, in 2022, we collected 2.4 million reports of fraud I'm sad to say that is a vast undercount. That is, those are just the instances where we know people have actually contacted us. Um, and that accounts for over $8 billion lost by US consumers. Um, the areas where we are seeing the most complaints, uh, and so some of the things we're gonna cover today include imposter scams, online shopping scams, 
prize sweepstakes, lottery scams, investment scams, business opportunity and job opportunity scams. Um, it really runs the gamut. We are seeing a, a decline, unsurprisingly, in, in COVID scams as that recedes from the, the public uh, attention. But um, one, I don't like to say nice things about scammers very often, but one thing that they are is adaptable. Um, anytime some new problem or new disaster or new national concern comes up, some scammer is going to pounce on it and start trying to use it to make a buck. You know, when our Medicare numbers change, we got a whole bunch of uh, people trying to help us help us with that. Yep. Um, I mean, they're they're pouring over the news every day and trying to figure out if there's some new hook that they can use. Um, so one of the first things that I want to talk about, and like I mentioned, this is the number one scam we are seeing the most reports of, is what we call impersonator scams. Um, we've all been scammed, exposed to a number of scams. Each of us probably has strategies for trying to figure out: Are we facing something that's legitimate, or are we facing a scammer? Um, I hope we can provide some useful pointers here, but I also want to point out, I know you're being bombarded with these things. And so one thing I would really highlight is don't feel bad if you feel like you got snuckered. Actually, a lot of what scammers rely on is they don't want you to turn them in. And so they hope you feel embarrassed if you accidentally trip into a scam. I do this for a living. And I still get scammed. You know, I've lost money here and there. Luckily, I've never lost a large amount of money. But at the same time, we all face things that we just don't have time to look into. And we've realized that we bought something that we thought was way better than it was um, or things like that. Don't feel embarrassed uh, if you find that you have been the victim of a scam. That is what the con artists want. They want you to feel like you can't tell anybody. They want you to feel like it makes you look bad somehow to have fallen for a scam. Don't feel that way. The most important thing you can do is put a stop to it, change what's going on so you don't uh, risk any further loss and report them so that we can stop them from doing it to other people. So impersonator scams um, or imposter scams are scams that trick you into thinking that there's somebody else. It could be a legitimate business. It could be the government. It could be a person that you know. Um, and they do it through a variety of means. Um, but these are scams that we're seeing growing and growing and growing. As you can see over the course of just the last three years for which we have data, we've seen more than tripling in the amount of money lost to these scams to the point where over half a billion dollars were reported lost by consumers to imposter scams alone. So even if that was every dollar lost, and like I said, I think that's a vast undercount um, we're talking multiple dollars for every single U.S. citizen on average. Uh, so that's a huge amount of loss. How does it work? You get a call or an email or a text or a message on social media from somebody claiming to be someone who you know or trust or have an existing relationship with. So it could be the government. It could be a retailer you have bought from. It could be... FedEx or UPS or the post office. Um, it could be the Social Security Administration or Medicare or the state or the IRS, any of these entities. And they're hoping that you're going to say, oh, well, I know that I have some sort of business with those entities. But the fact is, almost every single person in the country has some kind of business with the Social Security Administration or the IRS or Amazon, or FedEx, or UPS. And so the fact that they're saying that they're that entity and, and you do indeed have business with that entity doesn't necessarily mean that it's real. Um, they're just playing a numbers game. And they're saying, you know, most people who get this are going to have a relationship, um, or it might be a bank. And so if only, you know, 5% of people in the country bank with one bank, but they send that message out to a million people. 5% of a million people is 50,000 people they could be scamming. So they're just playing a numbers game. So don't necessarily assume just because it says that it's from a business that you have a relationship with or an agency you've done business with um, that it's necessarily real. Another key element that you'll often see in these scams is that they're telling you that something very bad or very good has happened. Basically, 
if it sounds too good or too bad to be true, it's pretty unlikely. Um, you know, one of the most frequent ones that we've heard of is the IRS has a warrant out for your arrest and we're calling you and you need to pay them immediately. Couple things here. I have never heard of the IRS actually giving you a courtesy call before they come and arrest you. That's not usually how warrants are served. Uh, usually you find out that there's a warrant for your arrest when somebody with a badge shows up at your door and, ha and with handcuffs. Um, if they're calling and saying there's a warrant for your arrest, they're trying to make you think urgently. They're trying to make you not think logically. They're not trying to make you not stop and pause and think about what they're saying. Or they might say, you've won a prize or there's a, a shipment that's got you know all of this great stuff coming for you and all you have to do is type in your personal information um, or call this number and you're going to get this great thing but you have to do it fast in either case what they're trying to do is trying to get you to not stop and think um, so basically the the number one piece of advice is when someone calls you and says that there's something urgent, whether it's urgently good or urgently bad, stop and think about whether it sounds realistic. If it is somebody who is posing as someone you know, stop and think of whether that's really the way they usually contact you. Stop and think of whether it sounds logical, whether it's, you know, if it's a relative who's con who claims that they're contacting you because they're in trouble um, in some foreign country, think, well, if I talked to them last week and they didn't mention anything about going to a foreign country, does it really seem likely that they're suddenly in jail in that foreign country? Um, maybe call another relative and see whether they really went there uh, before you expose yourself to potential significant loss. So after you get contacted, they'll do one of a few things. They'll either say, you need to give them money or they'll ask you for your social security number or they'll ask you for access to your computer, or they'll ask you for other protected consumer information that they can use to either steal money directly from you, use your identity to access credit um, as an identity thief, um, or otherwise, you know, they could, if they get access to your computer because it's uh, a tech support company, or for example, Microsoft or Apple calling and saying, there's a problem with your computer. We need to urgently take over your computer or else viruses are gonna take over it. And then suddenly you let the scammers take over your computer. They have access to everything you have saved on your computer. Um, and I, I will admit, I am one of the people who has, has grown up as a person whose entire life is on my computer. And so if somebody seized control of my computer, they'd have all my financial information, a lot of my health information, things like that. We live our lives online now. And so you've got to be careful about who gets access to that computer because just so much information is available on there. Um, so what are their, their lines, their, uh, the, the scams that they use like? They'll say something like, your Amazon account is suspended. You need to pay money to get it reinstated. If that's the case, you might want to just go to amazon.com and log in and see whether it says you actually owe money. You don't want to click on the link that they send you because the link that they send you is probably going to take you to a website that looks like it's Amazon, but it isn't. It's a fake company. And there's a lot of ways they can do that. They can, there's all kinds of little characters that look like other little characters. And so you might realize it's Amazon, but the O is a zero or something like that. Um, and by the time you realize it, it could be too late. So if you do get an urgent message and you think it might be real, the way I would encourage you is always use a different method to check whether it's real. If you get an email from a company that you do business with online, go straight to the website. Don't click their links. If you get a text message from somebody that you usually talk to by phone, call them. Um, it could be a spoofed number. It could be that they're just pretending. Call them at the number that you know to contact them at. Um, you could get a text message. I've gotten this one. The Your FedEx package is on the way. Click this link to update your delivery preferences. And I've gotten it on a day that I was expecting to get a FedEx package. And so I almost clicked on the link thinking, oh, uh, maybe they can't get into my building and I need to let them drop it off outside or something. But 
That's exactly what they're hoping for. And by the time you go to that form and you fill out your contact information, suddenly they've got your address and maybe your credit card information. Or um, if it's you know Lowe's or Home Depot saying, congratulations, uh, you've been chosen to take this survey and win a free drill. Um, you just pay the money for shipping. Um, usually if you don't enter contests, you don't win them. And so what my advice, anytime you get contacted by anybody about a contest that you don't, don't remember entering, telling you that you won, is you probably didn't win a contest because like, you don't win the lottery without buying a ticket. Uh, you don't win uh, a raffle without buying a ticket. That's just not how contests work. Um, so just be on the lookout for these kinds of things. Again, the best advice I can give you is just stop for a second and think about it. Does it make sense that you're getting this? Are they trying to make me think um, impulsively instead of pausing and thinking things through. Um, unexpected text messages are, are a huge part of it these days. Um, because again, if you're talking about these businesses that do business with a huge percentage of the population, they can just send these out to tons and tons and tons of people. And by sheer luck, some people are gonna be getting FedEx packages that day. Some people are going to be expecting to get a direct deposit in their bank account that day. Some people are going to be expecting these things. And so if it's not the method by which you usually communicate with that company or that agency or whoever it claims to be, then stop and think through. And again, try to reach out to them using the way that you usually do. Um, a lot of these, in addition to asking for money, will be asking for your information. And so you want to think through, is there a reason um, that this entity would need me to submit this information? Um, so some of them will say, oh, well, we need to verify your password or verify your PIN number. So for example, I've seen ones that pretend to be from a bank and they say, we need you to go to this website and type in your PIN number. My bank has never asked me to put my PIN number in on a website. The only place I ever use it is at a point of sale location. And so it's, again, you just have to look out for these little signs that something sounds hinky. And the more money that is involved in this, the more money they're saying that is going to, you know, you're going to need to pay for something or the more money that is in the account that they're asking for access to, the more you need to think about it because that's more risk to you. And they might not tell you the total amount that they're actually planning on taking from your bank account because if they suddenly have your bank account information and they can debit as much as they want and take that cash and move it overseas, it becomes very difficult to get it back. And so your best defense is being a bit too much on guard, uh, being a bit too doubtful of the things you're being told, um, and taking that extra minute and reaching out. Talk to a friend, say, hey, does this sound real? You can also call the FTC and say, hey, I encountered this. Does this sound legitimate? Does this sound fake? We can't give you legal advice, but we can be a gut check for you. And so at the end of this, I'm gonna give you our contact information, and you're certainly welcome to call us if you think something doesn't pass the smell test. I've gotten a couple of texts that say things like, I'm not sure, you know, I got your number and I'm trying to figure out who this is, or, um, you know, what, what color are your eyes again? Or something like that, where you don't know who it's from, mm -hmm. but they're starting a conversation and I just delete those. That's exactly the best thing you can do. Um, frankly, if you're getting text messages or phone calls from numbers you don't recognize, I just ignore them. Um, we can say something different about when I ignore the phone calls that come from numbers I do recognize. That's a different situation. But uh, when it's numbers that I don't recognize, I just ignore it. And yeah, some of them are just trying to bring up a conversation, get you talking, and then maybe two days later or two weeks later or two months later, when they've had you talking, when, they, when they've when they tricked you into thinking there's a personal connection here, um, then suddenly they say, oh, something terrible has happened. I need you to send me $5,000. And they get you to empty your savings account. Um, and by the time you realize that it's not who they said they were, you're out $5,000. And if that, like I said, if that money has been moved overseas or that money has just been spent, 
um, it becomes very difficult to get it back. Um, you know, if the FTC brings an action against a company that has defrauded people and they have money when we bring that action, we are often able to return money to consumers. But if they don't have the money anymore, the money's not there for us to return. And you can't get water from a stone and you can't get money from a bankrupt scammer. So one of the things that's important to remember when I say they're trying to get money from you is that money can take multiple different forms. So money can mean that they're trying to get you to transfer money by wire. It can be that they're trying to get you to buy a prepaid card. Um, a lot of these government imposters for a while were trying to get people to get either Amazon or iTunes or Google Play or really general gift cards that you can use on a lot of different things. And they'd send you to a retailer, whether it's a drugstore or a Walmart or something like that, to go and buy a thousand or five thousand dollars worth of these gift cards and say, oh, you need to pay it this way. The government doesn't want gift cards. I have never heard of any government agency that accepts payment in the form of gift cards. In fact, as a government employee, if I receive a gift card, it just creates a giant ethics dilemma for me about how to report it, and I don't get to keep it. And so I assure you, the government does not want gift cards. And if somebody is claiming to be the government and saying that you need to send gift cards, it's not real. Do they do uh, they sell them at a discount? Do we know what they <laughs> what? How do they convert it into cash? So it depends on what kind it is. If it's to a really general retailer, they might just do it. Uh, you know, they might just purchase things that they want um, if they have access to an address where they can have things shipped that they can then go away from very quickly. Obviously, you don't want to have a bunch of stuff shipped to an address that is also where you live if you are a scammer and you think you're going to be tracked. Uh, it can be that they use it to make online purchases um, through a series of transactions, attempts to convert it into cryptocurrency or something else. Um, or yes, they can sometimes just turn around and sell the gift cards. Usually what they'll do is they'll ask you to buy a bunch of physical gift cards and then read off the uh, numbers on the back of the gift cards. They won't actually ask you to send the physical cards anywhere, but those numbers are all that matters. And once they have those numbers, they have all the value that that gift card has and they will move quickly. So it's not like you're gonna get to change your mind a day later. Um, they will take it and run with it. I, I had that happen to me um, and I lost, I can't remember. I don't, I think I don't remember because I don't remember how many hundred I lost, but yeah, it was, and it was uh, Christmas Eve and it was like, hello. And I was right there at a grocery store and I could go in and get them. They weren't the grocery store after the first one, they weren't going to give me any more. And I'm going crazy because they're saying I've withdrawn too much from my bank, da, 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 all of that kind of stuff. And um, anyway, I, I get to I get up to my daughter's house. My granddaughter calls the people that that are, and they said there's nothing they can do about it. nothing. I yeah. So yeah, yeah. I I haven't done that since. Believe me. <laughs> That's good. That's good. And it's it's unfortunate. Bad, 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 bad. bad. It's unfortunate you had to learn that lesson the hard way. But again, it 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 just reinforces the point. Um, just always stop. Always think through. Um, it's, it sounds like it's good that there was somebody to, to put a stop so that you limited the loss because it can be, a, it can be a ton of money. And I have heard of situations where people have lost thousands and thousands of dollars and really their life savings to these sorts of things. And these scammers, there's no, there's no conscience that's stopping them from taking every penny they can get from you. Um, so whether it's a prepaid card, a gift card, a wire transfer or cryptocurrency, um, you know, these are all the ways that they're taking money now. Um, similarly, I have never heard of a U.S. government agency or any state government agency seeking payment in the form of cryptocurrency. So if somebody says, please pay in Bitcoin, that's probably a good sign that it's not something you want to do if they're not willing to accept currency denominated in U.S. dollars and they're a U.S. business, that would throw up some red flags for me too. So the big advice is don't click links in emails that you're not expecting, that you don't know who it's from. Don't call phone numbers you're not expecting because if they are recording that conversation and they are able to edit the recording that they have, if they get you saying the word yes to anything, 
Uh, then they'll just copy that and paste it over every time they want you to have said yes to anything they say. It is why I have made sure that I never answer the phone with the word yes. Um, however you choose to answer your phone, whether you answer the phone uh, at all is up to you, but do not answer with the word yes, or you are inviting scammers to use that. Never send money to people when you don't know where it's going. Um, always contact the company or the agency or the person using a method you have used before and that you know to trust. If you get an email from them and you've usually done business by phone, call the number that you already know or go to their website at the website you already know or if it's your bank, call the number on the back of your card. Something where it's not the communication that the scammer controls telling you the information about how to contact them. Um, so we'll move to another kind of scam. These are tech support scams. They're a, an unfortunate relative of the, uh, of the imposter scams. These are entities that trick you into thinking that there is some kind of problem with your computer. And the, the really sad irony is they're about to cause a problem for your computer. Um, one doesn't exist yet, but they're going to make there be one. So you'll get a phone call or you'll get a pop-up on your computer that says, this is tech support. This is, you know, your antivirus and I've detected a problem with this website. If it's a pop-up and it says that it's your antivirus or some program that's on your computer, I'd always just stop and think, wait a second, did I install that program? Um, so if you get a pop-up that says it's from Norton Antivirus and you have a different antivirus, not Norton, then Norton shouldn't be giving you real alerts. So that's a good sign that that's a scam. It's probably not actually Norton either. Um, or if you have a Mac and you're getting a pop-up that says Microsoft has de detected a problem, um, that's a pretty good sign. But again, it's a numbers game. They're putting this pop-up on tons of websites. So, and tons and tons of people are seeing them. So some people are just gonna happen to have the software or the operating system that they're guessing. And so you need to look more closely. If it's telling you it's found viruses on your computer and that you need to act fast, um, that's generally a bad sign, particularly if it is a browser window, if it's part of the actual internet program as opposed to a separate program that has popped up um, that you have previously installed on your computer. It's a good sign that it, it's not real. And again, they're gonna rely on scammers favorite method which is to try to convince you that you need to move quickly, try to convince you that you need to uh, act fast or else you're gonna suffer some harm. Because as soon as you click on the link or as soon as you start putting in your information or as soon as you give them control of your computer, um, suddenly they have the ability to do way more damage than just some virus does. So if it is a phone call that is telling you that there is a problem with your computer, Microsoft doesn't call people because there's a problem with their computer. Apple doesn't call people because there's a problem with their computer. That's not how it works. Um, if you have paid previously for a service to do that and you know that fact, then maybe say, okay, I'm gonna call you back at the number I know to call for this. But if it is just an unexpected phone call and it's not how you've communicated with any about this, anyone about this before, just hang up the phone. You don't have to be polite to scammers. You can hang up on them. In fact, if you want an opportunity to be impolite to somebody because you're mad at somebody else in your real life, you have to be polite to. A scammer is a great opportunity to get that uh, anger out and just hang up on them. Never give them control of your computer. Never let them take over your screen. Never let them have any access to your personal information, your credit card information, your social security number, your passwords, anything like that. As soon as you give them that little in, to your financial and personal information, then suddenly it becomes a lot easier for them to access more of it. So you wanna make sure that you are keeping that completely guarded. Again, if you are concerned that there is a real problem, then do what you would do if you discovered a problem for yourself. If there's someone who you trust to be your support person, contact them. If you usually go to the retailer you bought your computer from, you can call them but do not trust that this entity that is popping up and telling you that there's a giant problem is telling you the truth because as likely as not, what they're trying to do is cause you a problem. Another big area where we're seeing growth of scams is in investments. Um, there are lots of scams that uh, trick you into losing money and th these are scams that trick you into thinking you're going to make money. Um, 
Over the course of just one year, from 2021 to 2022, the amount of losses to investment scams more than doubled. Um, so in 2022, consumers reported $3.8 billion of losses to investment scams. On average, that means the average American lost more than $10 to an investment scam. But unfortunately, it's not that people all lost $10. It's that some people lost lots and lots of money. And these are places where we really do hear about people losing their life savings. People put in their money thinking that it is an opportunity to either make more money or safely diversify or avoid some sort of downturn. Um, and it turns out that it's completely made up. So where do you see it? You see an infomercial or an ad online or something that tells you you're gonna make a ton of money really quickly. I'm sure we all know here, there is no get rich quick. The only way that you're gonna make money in life is you've gotta work really hard. Um, it, you know, it, it's painful. It, we all would love it if suddenly, you know, we won the lottery, but unless you bought a ticket, you're not gonna win the lottery. And similarly, you know, if somebody tells you that they have figured out the stock market and they're gonna let you in on their secret, a lot of money goes into trying to figure out the stock market that really rich people do. And uh, even that only generates returns that we're talking about five, 10, 15% a year. So when people are suddenly saying, I'm gonna double your money in six months, that's probably not realistic. Um, they're telling you that it's low risk, that it's quick, that it's easy, that you don't have to do anything. One of the reasons they don't want you doing anything is because the less you do, the less insight you have into what's being done with your money. And so they want you to turn over all your money so that they can invest it or use it how they, they want to, whether it's in cryptocurrency or in some other system. Um, but they're telling you that they have a proven system that they don't explain to you what it is, or they do, but they're just using a bunch of jargon that they know you're not going to recognize. Um, and so they're going to try to appeal to you. They're going to try to talk to you about all the wonderful things you can get if you just do this. They're going to tell you about all the ways that you can uh, make your life better or how you can help your friends or your family. They can talk to you about how, oh, aren't you worried about the economy is scary right now? The economy, you know, what if the stock market crashes? Don't you want to hedge against that? Um, but what they're trying to get you to do is put tons of money into a vehicle that there is no evidence whatsoever that it works. And it is often unregulated, it's uncontrolled, there's no insurance for it. And when they've got your money and they've taken it and run with it and they've paid themselves and they've made sure that they made lots of money, they don't care whether you make money. Um, I encourage you, if you are thinking about investing money in anything, Spend plenty of time doing research. The, one of the simplest ways you can do this is do an online search with the name of the company and the word scam or the word review. Um, because often you will see lots of people have gone online and said, this sounds like a scam. You can of course also look to see whether any regulators like the FTC, like the SEC, which is the Securities and Exchange Commission or a state attorney general has brought any kind of enforcement action because there are concerns about them being scammers. Um, I really encourage you to speak to a trusted financial advisor or someone who you trust for advice about finances before investing money in anything like this, because there are tons of these scams out there. People put thousands, if not tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars into these things. You know, They might put their entire retirement into it thinking, they're gonna have tons more money than they expected and suddenly they have nothing. I have heard abundant stories of people who wound up having to work decades later than they planned to, um, things like that, because they thought this was gonna have them covered and it didn't. And I know we are near the end of the time, so I'm gonna to to go a little bit quickly through the remaining things, but I don't have anything right after this. So if anybody has questions afterward, I'm happy to stick around. Um, one of the other areas that we have seen growth in scams is charity fraud. These are scams that try to trick you into thinking that they're going to do all kinds of good in the world. They want to appeal to um, your desire to help and to be a good person. Um, and they take it and they use the money just to make themselves richer. This can come in tons of different forms. It can be calls, texts, emails, cards, or letters. And they use names for these organizations. They do set up corporate entities, and they potentially even register them as nonprofit corporations with the IRS. Um, but they'll use a name that sounds just a little bit different 
from really famous charities. So if you hear the name, you might immediately think, oh, I, I feel like that sounds kind of familiar, but it's not the one you're used to hearing. So um, it seems real. They'll have big websites and they'll have pretty pictures of all the wonderful things they're doing, the sick kids that they're helping, the firefighters that they're helping, uh, the veterans that they're providing services to. But in reality, they're not spending a significant amount of money uh, to actually help those people. They're spending the vast, vast majority of those dollars on fundraising and on paying their own internal staff. Um, so the way that a lot of these work is they start off by telling you about a pledge that you've already made or implying that you've previously given and you maybe don't remember having given, but I know I have sometimes just given $20 to somebody not really thinking about it. And so maybe I did in the past, but they talk about your pledge and they try to make you make good on your pledge. Um, and they pressure you to really quickly commit to paying again. And they ask you if they can send you a pledge envelope and whether you'll commit to giving $20 or $50. And they'll try to get any amount they can out of you. Um, or they'll ask you for cash, for gift cards, um, to wire them money or to send them cryptocurrency. Again, if it's a legitimate charity, what they want is probably money, like actual cash money, not gift cards or uh, crypto or anything like that. Um, but it's a high pressure tactic. They wanna tell you about, oh, we're trying to get this appeal done. We're trying to get this campaign done this week. Could you really please send it immediately? Trying to make you not stop and think. I encourage you to go either to the state secretary of state's website or to other services online that you can find that provide reviews of charities. Or if you really wanna go into the weeds, um, you can look at the IRS forms, the forms for every nonprofit organization in the United States uh, that allows them to have their tax exempt status. It's called a 990 and you can actually look at it and see how they spend their money. Um, it's a lot of digging and there are faster ways to do it. But if you want to get in the weeds because you want to make a big donation or something, it can be worth it to take the time to do that digging to make sure that your money that you want to send to help people is actually accomplishing those tactics or accomplishing those goals. Um, another thing we're seeing on the rise are romance scams. Um, these target people of all ages, uh, from people who are just installing Tinder right out of, you know, in college all the way up uh, to, you know, every age group. And um, it works roughly the same, but the, the risk can be different. Um, somebody contacts you on social media or you meet them on a dating website. Um, they start talking to you, you form this intense connection to this person, through messaging and you're talking with them online and you haven't met them. Maybe you've exchanged some photos or something, but you've never actually met them in person. Um, but they tell you that they love you. They want to move really fast. They're looking for commitment and things like that. And then shortly after they've gotten you in, they've gotten you hooked. They hit you with, I'd love to meet you, but I need money to buy a plane ticket or my kid is sick and I need money to take them to the doctor. Um, or I need a visa if you're saying that they're abroad and could you send me money to help pay for it? Or any number of other things where suddenly this person you have never met in person um, and who you met online, but who you formed this connection because we all wanna meet someone. We all want love. We all want that connection. They are uh, trying to take advantage of the fact that we want to be loved and we want to love and we want to help people and we want to be good people and they're trying to take advantage of that. So if you have met someone on an online dating site um, and this isn't to say that you can't use those, they're fine. I, I have used them. I have met people that who have been wonderful people. But if you haven't met this person in person, do not send them money. Do not uh, provide them with uh, sensitive financial information. Do not provide them with the kind of information that would be they would be able to do you harm with. Um, it's just not worth it. It's not worth the risk. Um, and unfortunately, there are people who are trying to take advantage of some of our most basic human desires there. And again, 
you'll see once again, it's these same methods uh, that you see come up again and again and again. They ask for a wire transfer. They ask for a prepaid card. They ask for gift cards. They ask for cryptocurrency. They don't want you to use uh, a credit card and they don't want you to use a check because those methods actually have some pretty strong fraud controls. And so uh, if you are going to send money because you feel like you have to, I would always encourage you use a credit card. Um, even if you pay it off entirely, using a credit card has higher fraud protections than even a debit card. Um, or use a check where there's actually the ability to track what account it got deposited into. It becomes a lot easier to follow the money through those methods. So your odds of if something goes wrong are a lot higher if you use those methods than if you send any other, you know, if you send these prepaid cards or gift cards. Cryptocurrency, the entire concept of cryptocurrency is that people don't want to be tracked. They want to use this so no one can see what happened with it. Um, and so if you were a scammer, you'd probably love all of your money to come in in cryptocurrency too. Um, all of those are just red flags. The big message, the big takeaway from all of this is simply be on the lookout stop, take a second to think about things. If you hear a friend or a loved one mentioning that they got contacted about something and they were thinking about sending money or sending personal information, maybe you can also help us out by mentioning to them that you have a little bit of concern and maybe they should stop and think. Maybe they should go to the FTC's website and do a little reading about that kind of thing. Um, because we're actually a pretty tiny agency. We've only got about 12 or 1300 employees all across the country here in Washington um, to cover the entire six state Northwest region. We've only got about two dozen of us. So you can really do a lot of good for our community by helping just get the information out there to have people be on the lookout, start these conversations. You can send them to our website, which is ftc.gov. Um, you can sign up for consumer alerts to get in your email more information about what we are seeing as things develop. Like I mentioned, scammers are adaptable. There's always new stuff coming up out. And like I said, if you happen to work with organizations that could use some of these materials to distribute, um, we do make them available both in electronic form and in paper form free of charge. Mm -hmm. Finally, if you think oh, you've been ahead. scammed, report. This is what I was gonna ask, yes. Yes, if you think you have been scammed or if you think somebody tried to scam you, you can report it to us whether they succeeded or not. Um, them trying to scam you is also unlawful. Um, you don't have to wait until they scam you. And like I said, you also don't need to be embarrassed. I do this for a living and I have been scammed. It's something that we unfortunately all deal with. Con artists are, it's their job. It's what they do. Um, they've gotten very good at it. And so the fact that they have managed to scam you is no reason to be embarrassed, but it is a reason to report them so we can put a stop to what they're doing. And so we can try to get money back for consumers who've been harmed, um, or at the very least, stop future consumers from being harmed. So you can do that either by calling us at 1-877-FTC-HELP or by going to reportfraud.ftc.gov. But if all you remember is simply ftc.gov, all of the links and all of this contact information and all of the information that we've covered today is available there.